Everybody hear me? Yeah. We good? Everybody hear me? Up a little bit? Just a little bit? Well, I hope everybody had a, a good afternoon in the Lord. So we're going to break a, another scripture down tonight and then next week we'll probably move into a study of some kind. <clears throat> I just want to do this for a couple of weeks just to kind of let you uh, one, see how I do it when I'm studying a text as I prepare, but also to show you, you know, personally how to break down a scripture. Um, I was never taught how to break down a scripture. I had to learn it on my own. Um, and that's necessarily nobody's fault, but it sure would have been nice if somebody would have sat me down one day and said, hey, let me show you how to do this. So, um, we'll need your Bible. We're going to look at a, <clears throat> another verse also to back up this, this scripture. Again, this is the NIV version. Um, so if, I hope you have a pen. If you don't, I bet we can probably find you one somewhere. <clears throat> We're going to look at Romans 8, 1 through 3 tonight. Uh, give you a little bit to write down and some lines to draw and things to underline, things to circle. Show you something pretty key in this passage. But uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer. <clears throat> and then we'll, we'll jump into it. And Hopefully tonight it won't take as long as what it did last week. So. Father, thank you for today. Father, thank you that you love us. Father, thank you that you allow us to assemble together to sing songs to you and about you. Father, let's pray right now that as we begin to worship you through your word. Father, as we um, take our pens and highlighters or whatever it may be, and we take a, a text apart. Father, I pray that we would do that with integrity. That you would be glorified in it. And Father, reveal some, some things in this passage uh, that we can apply to our lives. Father, just pray that what is said and what is done here tonight will be strictly to glorify you and, and you alone. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. The, uh, you know, most of your, your newer Bibles, they have your little subheadings in them. You know, over each passage as it's broken down. And, uh, the name of this particular passage is called Life Through the Spirit. So to help us with that, I want to encourage you to write that above Romans 8, 1 through 3, Life Through the Spirit. Just to give it a, a title. When the uh, Bible was originally written, New Testament and Greek, we know that everything ran together. They didn't have chapters and they didn't have verse numbers and, and things like that. It was one big writing. It would be like we would write a letter and because this is a letter to the Romans. So it would be like us sitting there writing a letter. If we was to write a loved one a letter or uh, maybe somebody serving our country overseas and we was to mail that to them, when they received that letter, it wouldn't be... Uh, chapter 1, starting in verse 1, what does verse 1 through 6 say? It wouldn't be that. It would just be a writing. So later scholars went in and they broke it down into verses and chapters. And then now we've got subtitles to each um, section of Scripture that has a, a certain thought. So that's why, you know, nowadays we have that. <clears throat> okay, a couple of things. Uh, let's read this together first and then we'll, we'll begin to break it apart. It says, therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. For what the law was powerless to do because it was weakened by the flesh, God did by sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh to be a sin offering. And He condemned sin in the flesh. When, verse 1 Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. That is the gospel. That verse right there. You can take that verse. We can have an invitation. People get saved. We go home. 
That's powerful enough right there. That is the gospel. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Paul didn't have to say anything else to the Romans. He could have stopped right there. There's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. That is the gospel of Jesus Christ right there. Verse 1 has enough theological power for salvation to take place. And it's just as simple as that, and that's the facts. But let's break this thing down. Now, the first thing I want you to notice in this passage is this, particularly in verses 2 and 3. And we're, we're going we're to jump around a little bit tonight. But did you notice that as we read this, that there were three different laws? There were three different laws. And I want you to underline them and then I want you to write them also. Uh, probably in the top right hand side of your paper. So watch this. We got verse 2. Because through Jesus, or through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit. So circle that or underline that law of the Spirit. That's the first law. So because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from, here's the second one, the law of sin and death. So there's the second law, law of sin and death. And then verse 3, for what the law, and circle that law, and I'm going to give you the meaning of that in just a moment. So we have three laws in this passage. So if you want to, you can either number them or write them out again. I'm going to write them out. I'm doing that for my benefit. The first one is this. The law of the Spirit. Second one is the law of sin and death. And the third one, the only title we have is law. So it's just... It's just commonly known that this is going to be the law of Moses, which would be the original Ten Commandments. So the law, the third law is the law of Moses. <clears throat> now the reason this is important because we're given the law of Moses originally, and we're going to backtrack. We're going to do this backwards just for a moment. So we're, we're given the law of Moses at the original Ten Commandments, and then that was taken, and they were broken off into more commandments and, and more laws. Okay, and then the law of sin and death comes into play. And the reason the law of sin and death comes into play because mankind could not keep the law of Moses fully. Therefore, that caused us to be sinners and the, the result of sin is death. So now we have the law of sin and death, which pretty much overrode the law of Moses. But the beautiful thing about that is the other one, the law of the Spirit, which is, is Jesus and what He did for us on the cross. And that trumped the other two. So we have the law of the Spirit, the law of sin and death, and the law of Moses that are found in this one passage. Alright, so now, let's go. I wanted to point that out because that's going to be very important as we walk through this. Therefore, remember what I told you last week about that word? What's it there for? Okay, so we're talking about the law. And this is what this word is there for. So put emphasis on that word, therefore, however you want to do that. Why is it there? Chapter 7 is about the law. When you read chapter 7, Paul is saying, I do what I don't want to do and I don't do what I want to do because of the law. Paul is saying, I'm trying I'm trying to do this. I'm trying to be the, the Christian that I'm supposed to be. I'm trying to be this Christ follower that, that God expects me to be. And he said, I, I try to do, but I can't do it. I continue to fail because of the law, because of the law. Now, let's back up into verse or chapter 7. Let's look at that last verse. Because that's how this thing is going to flow. And that's where that word, therefore, comes into play at. So chapter 7 is about the law. Particularly... And he ends it with this last verse in chapter 7. And this is what it says. It says, Thanks be to God. And I'm reading it now. He says, Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. And he just, what he's doing, he's thanking God because of all this stuff that he's struggling with. And now watch how he ends this. 
So then I myself in my mind am a slave to God's law. So he's a slave to God's law. He's trying to serve God's law. But in the sinful nature, a slave to the law of sin. What was one of our laws in chapter 8? The law of sin and death. So what he's saying is, is I'm a slave to God's law, which is it's going to be the law of the Spirit. It's going to be Christ covering all of this. And then he finishes up chapter 7 with but the sinful nature, a slave to the law of sin. Then you got that period and we start this new chapter. But remember, it's the same thought. So then he says, therefore. And then he starts this whole new thing. Okay. Therefore. So we know what the therefore is there for now, right? No? Okay. So then there's two words here. Therefore, there is. Connect there is together with, with something. So the reason it's there is because something, and I'm writing this down in mind, something is taking place. So if Paul was to be speaking this to us today, he would say, therefore, something is taking place. I'm struggling with the law. Struggling with keeping the law. I don't do what I want to do. I do what I don't want to do. Therefore, something now is taking place. So if he's talking to this person, he said, he would say, listen to me. Something is taking place. When is it going to take place? Now, this is what I want you to get. What's that next word? Now. Therefore, there is, and in thought, something taking place. When is it taking place? It's taking place now, right now. That is a present tense word. Right now, something is taking place. Alright, now here's the beautiful thing about this. That word condemnation, put it in, in like blocks or parentheses or, or something. And we're not skipping that word, no, we're going to come to it in just a second. Alright, so what does condemnation mean? It's simple, it means punishment. So write that word punishment somewhere around that word condemnation. So if we was to remove that word no, this passage would read, therefore there is something taking place now, which is punishment. But because of Jesus, we've got the, a new verdict. And that word no is the verdict. It's the final say. And what God is saying through Jesus, no, there is no condemnation because of who you are in Christ Jesus. So that word no, that's the final verdict for the word condemnation. The word condemnation is a powerful word, but that word before that trumps the word condemnation. No, meaning the verdict has been said by God. There is no condemnation. So that word no is the verdict. Alright, four. So therefore there is no condemnation for. For who? That word those. Who are these people? These people are us. These are the Christians. So write Christians somewhere around that word those. And then when you get that word written, draw an arrow from that word those to Christ. Because we are Christ Christians, Christians, however you want to do that. Alright, now let me show you something too. Underline in Christ Jesus. Make that one, one thing. In Christ Jesus. And then in verse 2 starts because through Christ Jesus. So underline in Christ Jesus and then through Christ Jesus. How do we get in Christ? Because that's the key right here in verse 1 and verse 2. Therefore there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit. And then it goes on. And in some versions of the Bible... That in verse 2, it also says in Christ Jesus instead of through. But it's the same meaning whether it's in or through. It's the same connotation, same meaning right here in this passage. So how do we get in Christ? 
We get it from God. God is the one who makes this happen. The in Christ Jesus that comes from God. On the bottom of your paper somewhere, I want you to write this. From God You draw a line or something. We're, we're going to put three little phrases together and let it flow. So from God, then write in Christ. And then write no condemnation. So God made it happen. It comes from God. Salvation takes place. We were guilty. But then when Christ hung up on the cross and He rose on the third day, we were found innocent. It says there is now no, the verdict, no condemnation. So from God in Christ. We're the ones in Christ. Because we're in Christ and there is no condemnation. So being in Christ means... That we are free from punishment. Because through Jesus or through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives us life has set you free from the law of sin and death. Being in Christ, again, is what sets you free. I am free because of Jesus. All right, now I want us to connect two of these laws. On the second line there, so because through, Je through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit, and then on the third line, has set you free from the law of sin and death. Draw a double-sided arrow. And make these two words connect. Law and law. So go, you're going to go kind of go down across your page a little bit. Connect them two words, law and law. Because these are going to play together. Okay, the next one is spirit and sin. Connect spirit and sin. Because of Jesus. We now don't have to worry about sin. And then there's another word kind of hanging out there by itself or at the end of line two, life. Circle that word and then draw that same double-sided arrow from death to life. So the law and the law, spirit, sin, and then life and death. Which means that puts emphasis on this, this whole concept here. Alright, so let's, let's move on along to the third line. Has set you free. So if we were to just say that, has set you free, my first question would be this. From what? From what? And then Paul answers this question from the law of sin and death. So we are set free from being condemned. We are set free from being guilty. Because we were both. Every one of us are guilty in our sin. And we deserve the punishment. We deserve to be condemned to hell. But because of Jesus, we're not. Alright, starting at verse 3. For what the law was powerless to do, put some emphasis on that word powerless. That raises a question. 
For what the law was powerless to do because it was weakened by the flesh, God did by sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh to be a sin offering. So what was it powerless to do? It says for the law, the law of Moses, because that's that law, the law for what the law was powerless to do. What was it powerless to do? Now you're fixing to draw a big old arrow somewhere from that word powerless. You see that last line? There's this big word that pops up again in that last sentence. That word condemned. Put some emphasis on that word condemned. And then draw an arrow from powerless to that word condemned at the bottom. Now we're going to hit this word condemned again in a few moments because this condemned has a different meaning than the first condemned. Because if you notice in the first condemned in that first line, so therefore there is no condemnation, which means there is no condemnation. It's as simple as that. But the last one, we'll get to it in a minute, but means there's some guilt in there. Okay? Everybody lost? Okay. So what is it that made this powerless? There's a word on down just a little bit. It said, for what the law was powerless to do, because it was weakened by the what? The flesh. That's why it was powerless, because as mankind, we couldn't keep it. We couldn't keep the law of Moses. So that's why the law was powerless, because of our flesh. The law was established for us to keep a set of standards to live by that God gave us, but we couldn't keep those standards. Now here, here's the beautiful thing about God. God knew we couldn't keep them. And his ultimate plan was for Jesus to come. All the way back when Moses was standing on the mountain and God was, was, was writing this with his finger in into these stone tablets, God knew at that point they're not going to be able to keep. So God's plan a long time ago all the way back to the garden was for Jesus to come because we couldn't keep the law. So the law was powerless because of our flesh, our sinful nature that we carry around with us every single day because we can't do it. We can't attain it. That's good stuff. Now, it was weakened because of us. Because of just the human being that we are. That's why it was weakened. That's why it was powerless. Because we couldn't do it. We we're unable to maintain the law. All right, now I want you to circle as we move on through that one, two, three, that fourth line there. Circle that word God. Circle God. And then on the next line, circle His, because that's God. And you can write out there somewhere to let you know that that's still God speaking. And that's who He's talking about. Uh, his own son. His son is going to be Jesus. We know that. So we can put, as they would say, names to faces and faces to names. And then in that last line of the passage, and so he condemned, he again being God. So we just want to point that out that who we're talking about. Uh, this fix to get good. So God did by sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh to be a sin offering. So what, because our flesh couldn't handle it, because we couldn't live by it, we couldn't attain it, God said, I'm going to send Jesus. He's going to take on human flesh. He's going to take on sinful flesh, although He was not 
He did not sin. I want us to understand that. He, he was sinless, the perfect human being, but he lived in sinful flesh, if that makes sense. Because he took on the human body and he lived among humans who every one of us are sin, sinners and we have sinned. So God sent his son into a sinful body but lived a sinless life. Now that's deep and that's good stuff. And it's so hard for us to wrap our minds around that God would do that. Why would God do that? Goes all the way back to the very first part of it. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Because of what was done for us, we are now found to be in Christ. And when God looks at us now, He doesn't look at just the old beat down dirty sinner that we are. He sees us through His Son because His Son lived in this body and lived a perfect life. So God sent His Son to live in that sinful flesh that it talks about there in verse 3. So, draw you a line from Son, which surely you wrote Jesus above that, from Son to sinful flesh. So that we can know and recognize that that is Jesus that took on that form. And in the likeness, now this is what I want you to get here. That word likeness, that's mankind. That's us. Alright, now, I'm going to have you turn to a, a scripture. But write this scripture under that word likeness. Philippians 2.7. So write that down. And then I want us to turn there to show you this. So if you have your Bibles open, turn to Philippians 2.7. <clears throat> and we'll look at this right quick and then we'll come back. The Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians. So Paul, he's writing this, this letter to this church and, and in chapter 2 of Philippians he's talking about Jesus and, and just some attributes of Jesus about him you know, being compassionate and different things like that and about him being humble and this is the pinnacle of humility because we know that Jesus was sitting on his throne he was in all his glory and all his power he didn't have to come down here and do what he did to take on sinful flesh as he says to the Romans but this is what he says in Philippians 2.7 about Jesus, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature. Whose nature did he take on? Us, a servant, being made in human likeness. So, when we look at that passage in Romans, it says, God did by sending his own son in the likeness, in human likeness, of sinful flesh. So that's where that comes into play at. So when he came, what did he do? He was a sin offering. So let's put verse 3 together. <clears throat> For what the law, the law of Moses, what the law was powerless to do because it was weakened, because we couldn't do it, by the flesh, which was ours, God did by sending His own Son, Jesus, in the likeness of humankind, as Philippians 2.7 says, of sinful flesh, still us, to be a sin offering. Something had to die. When we sin, something has to die. So God said, now that you can't do this, you can't keep the law, I'm going to send my son, he's going to live in human flesh, he's going to live with you, and he's going to be the ultimate offering because there has to be a sin offering. And that sin offering is Jesus' death. So that is why all this is going together now. It says, God did by sending His own Son in the likeness of the sinful flesh to be a sin offering. We know that Jesus' death is the ultimate sin offering. So you can put out beside sin offering or 
however you want Jesus' death. Because that trumped every sacrifice, every offering that there ever will be. So we've got the line now. Let's back up just a little bit from that word powerless all the way to condemn. Now, here's the beautiful thing about this word. This means guilt. So we got a little help on that first condemnation. So therefore there's now no condemnation. There is no punishment because the verdict has been stated. That's it. God said no punishment. But this condemn at the end of this passage, this is guilt. Something somebody is found guilty. All right, and watch this because this is good. So draw a line from that word and, and so he condemned sin and flesh. Draw a line from and to flesh. Now you see the word sin and sinful. Sinful is right above that word sin. Draw a line from there to that and then from flesh to flesh. So we got sinful and sin, flesh to flesh. Now this is what I want you to get. Christ is in the flesh but had no sin. That is why the law could not condemn us. But Jesus condemned sin when He took sin on His shoulders. The law could not condemn us because of Jesus. But it's only because of Jesus that, that, that sin is guilty. Sin is guilty. And that's why that word condemned means. It, it means guilt right there. There's no verdict other than guilt. You're condemned. It says, so He condemned sin. Sin was found guilty because sin was poured on Jesus. So therefore, we are not found guilty because it all was, the wrath of God was poured out on His Son. And that phrase, that one phrase right there, the last sentence in that passage, and so He condemned sin in the flesh. That is what took care of us on the cross. That happened on the cross right there. And so he condemned sin in the flesh. Jesus took on human flesh. Jesus died. Therefore he condemned sin. Sin was guilty, but it died in the flesh. And therefore now we are not guilty. And there's no condemnation found in us because we are in Christ Jesus. So let's skim through here right quick. See if there's anything else that maybe we can pull out of this. Because I'm seeing something in here and I want you to see it. In verse 2, it says, Because through Christ, Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit. You say the word Spirit? So we got the Spirit. Verse 3. So for what the law was powerless to do because it was weakened by the flesh of God. So you got the Spirit, you got God. Did by sending His own Son, you got Jesus. You have the Trinity in this passage. And the Trinity is at work in this passage. All three aspects of the Trinity are right there. The Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. And all of that works together Therefore, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. That one, that one phrase, therefore, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, is the gospel. And that is what the gospel is about. And then, just to, to add it to it, man, the Trinity is right there at work. All three aspects of God is working in our lives to keep us from being guilty of the sins that we commit. Because Jesus died on the cross to save us from it. That is why the name of the passage is Life Through the Spirit. Because therefore there is no condemnation for those who are found in Christ Jesus. Anybody got any questions about that? Does your paper look kind of funny now? 
You're going to look at it later and like, I can't put that together. I just want to remind you that that word condemnation is a legal term. It's a legal term. Paul talked about the law. Now we're condemned, you know, condemned, but we're not condemned because of Jesus. Well, I hope that that helps you a little bit as far as breaking down a, a passage. I enjoy doing that on my free time, but I'm weird, so. But I, I mean, I really enjoy doing that. And I just, I wanted to take a couple weeks and, and share that with you guys. That, you know, like I said, I wish somebody had done that for me 20 years ago. You know, and they did. You know, I've had people stand up there and say, turn over your Bible to such, 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 and read the story. But why? And that's, that's what I've always asked myself. Why? You know, when I read a passage, I'm like, why? Why? How? You know. So, so as you, you grow closer to God, I want you to, to start doing that. You know, if you're struggling with a passage, you're struggling with what something means or how it might relate to you, man, copy and paste that dude, print that dude off, and take a pen and dissect it. Get a dictionary. I say, what, what does that word mean? You know, what, what does condemnation mean? You know, Webster was a pretty smart dude, you know. I use Webster all the time. You know, it's just that's part of it. So I, you know, I just pray that that you can take those tools and use them and, and we might do this again sometime. You know. Um, I enjoy it so.